When I first met Travis in college, he told me he wanted to be a management consultant. I liked him and I liked the idea of his stable, predictable career. So we dated, we got married, and life was just as I'd pictured it for about two weeks. <laughs> See, at this point, Travis told me that instead of having that stable, predictable career, he wanted to make board games. In my defense, I like to think that the signs were there. I grew up playing board games with eight overly competitive siblings, and we always enforced pretty intense house rules. So it wasn't totally out of the blue when we decided to build our own board game. And I had dabbled in graphic design as the editor of my high school yearbook. So armed with my limited Photoshop experience and a few design principles I'd picked up, I set out to design this board game Travis had been dreaming of. I quickly realized I needed some help, so we hired an illustrator to work with us as well. We spent about a year designing and testing the game, and then we put it on Kickstarter, hoping to earn enough money to make some copies for friends and family. We pushed the launch button and waited, and then somehow a stranger came across our idea, put their faith in us, and ordered a copy of the game. We were thrilled. And then 3,000 other people did the same, and we were terrified. <laughs> So we dove in, and we learned everything we could about working with factories, shipping pallets, and selling to retailers. And since then, we've sold over 100,000 games, and we now both work from home full-time making games. Right now, we're working on number five, and as we look back at our process, we've noticed some patterns start to emerge. So here's an idea of what the process of building a board game might look like for us. One of the most common questions we receive is, how do you get the ideas for your games? Well, the ideas that provide that initial spark for version one come from lots of places. They might come from looking at the notes of an old economics or history lesson. They come from observing a new culture or castle when we travel. Or maybe they come from playing existing games and combining the mechanics in new ways. They come from the two or three emails we get each week from the guys who claim they've come up with the next million dollar game idea and want to give us a cut of the action. But wherever they come from, one idea tends to stand out above the rest, and we get so excited to test it out. And we build some basic game rules, and just with this optimism that we have landed on an absolute gem, we test it out. And it's always so bad. <laughs> for, for version two, we completely scrap the first idea and go back to the drawing board for about the next seven versions. And for these early versions, we really try to fail quickly so that we don't get stuck on a path that isn't going to work. So this means Travis and I sit and play the game over and over, changing rules and mechanics as we go, and this might sound like fun. We're playing games all the time. But essentially, we're playing bad games for weeks on end. This is called playtesting, and it can be brutal, especially since our games are classified as social deduction, which means they're all about deception and manipulation. Our games also have high player counts, so we each have to simulate several players. So when you're acting as three different characters who are all lying to each other, it can really get overwhelming. <laughs> Around version 16, we've added all sorts of exciting elements like card drafting, dice rolling, set collection, and pretty soon the game starts to feel like the cones of Dunshire. It's just way too complex, and it starts to feel like work to actually play it. So we begin the most important and the most difficult part of creation, which is subtraction. Now, creators have a natural tendency to love and nurture new ideas. But to make a game that is simple to understand, yet intriguing to play, you have to get into the habit of continually subtracting unnecessary or clunky ideas from the game. Now, around version 18, thankfully, we're recruiting new playtesters. Um, we have been so fortunate to have a great group of friends come to our house weekly and suffer through our latest prototype. And this really is key to finding what does and doesn't work for the game, because good playtesters will encourage us to keep going and tell us what they like about the game. But the best playtesters really just rip our games to shreds with their feedback, and that honesty is invaluable. Around version 21, we start to incorporate a theme. One of our guiding questions is, who do players get to be while they're in our world? A colonist accused of witchcraft? A pirate mutinying against a devious captain? Or an outlaw robbing a safe behind his buddy's back? If players get to be someone else while they're playing, they can much more easily enter into that state of flow and get lost in the world that we've built for them. 
Now, somewhere around version 30, things start to get exciting. Uh, for example, I once had to work late and came home to a playtest night already in progress. So when I opened the front door, I expected to see four or five friends sitting at our table testing out our latest pirate-themed game. So you can imagine my surprise when I opened the door and walked into what I can only describe as a full-on pirate jamboree with standing room only. See, our playtesters had spread the word about our game, and as a result, our apartment was crammed with people wanting to play. Many of them had voluntarily come dressed as pirates. So this is really the kind of stuff that we look for to give us some motivation to keep going. It tells us we're doing good. And then, around version 37, I have a meltdown. <laughs> Something feels off, and things just aren't progressing like they should, and at this point, I'm ready to scrap the whole thing and go back to version 1. And this is when I do everything I can to talk him out of it, because remember, I will do anything to avoid going back to playtesting with just the two of us. But sometimes she doesn't talk me out of it, and the game is banished to my Island of Misfit Games Google Drive folder. If it does survive my meltdown, it still undergoes a major change at this point. The core mechanic is gutted, or the entire theme is changed to better fit the current direction of things. Near version 49, we're watching our playtesters closely for certain signs of engagement. Now, you might think that we're looking for satisfied smiles during gameplay, but really the best metric that shows us the progress of our game is actually screaming. <laughs> if we can get players to scream during a game, we know we're pulling out real emotion with the mechanics and that we're on a good track. From versions 50 to 70, we focus on the three ingredients that make up the secret sauce of a great game. Balance, making sure that cards and player abilities aren't overpowered. Autonomy, making sure that the level of luck and skill is just right so that players feel like they control their own destiny, but they're still responsible for leveraging good fortune and surviving unlucky rolls of the dice. And replayability, making sure that the conditions are a little different every time people play so that each time they get out the game, it feels like a new experience. Now, around version 71, we get to shift our focus to design. And we're really trying to build this immersive world for our players to get lost in, right? So we look for colors and textures that complement the theme. And we also start to work with our brilliant illustrator who really gives life and style to the game. And since there are literally thousands of board games released each year, we also focus heavily on our packaging. And we actually package our games as books to help them stand out. In the last few versions, we start to uh, incorporate our factory and keep them in the loop. We talk with them about the components we want to use in the game, and we go back and forth with price quotes and game samples. Sometimes 60,000 dice are painted bright neon yellow instead of mustard yellow, but we're always able to work through these types of bumps in the road. In reality, we're really fascinated by this part of the process. It really feels like in today's world, if you can imagine something, a factory out there can create it. And finally, somewhere around version 87 or so, and about a year into this process, we get to manufacture our game and send it out into the world. And we imagine this is a little bit like sending a kid off to college. We've prepared it in every way that we can, and now it's on its own, and it's vulnerable to the real world. For us, that means YouTube reviews, Twitter comments, and Amazon stars. But whatever happens, we're proud of the game, we wish the best for it, and it's time for us to start again at version one with a new idea. Now, we know that none of you make board games for a living. We know this because we've already met most of the people who do. <laughs> but each of you is a creator in some way. And whether you deal with books or art or business or even in your family, your process is going to be different than ours, but we probably have a lot in common, like that need to subtract and simplify or to have a consistent test group or to put focus on thoughtful packaging and design. Whatever it is that you create, we hope that something we've shared about our process will help you move forward with your next version. And if, and if your idea is still waiting in the wings and hasn't yet left your mind, we hope that you'll start with your version one soon. Thank you.